Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSE. This lesson, salt. This topic's been suggested by a lot of people, including League Jaden, Zombie Overlord 9 Games, Kate Newport, Aman Parekh, Olivia, Matthew Bayliss, Mathman, Craig Davison and Davil Sheth. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic which you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. In GCSE chemistry, pretty much any time any acid reacts with any other substance at all, a salt will be formed. In another video, I'm going to cover the reactions of acids with metals and bases and alkalis. In this video, I'm just going to focus on what the name of the salt which is formed is and how we know which it is, and also how we would extract a dry sample of that salt which we've just produced. All salts have a two-part name. The first part is usually, although not always, a metal. And then the second part will tell us what type of salt that metal has formed. It'll be something like a chloride, or a sulfate, or a nitrate. So for example, let's have a look at table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. So you've got sodium, the metal, as the first part of the name, and chloride as the second part of the name. Now in this video, I'm going to focus on that second part, First, that may seem like an odd way round to do it, but you'll see why I'm doing that in a moment. That second part of the name depends on which acid we've used to form the salt. Remember, it's when an acid reacts with something that you form a salt. So if we know the name of the acid, we can start to figure out what the second part of the name of the salt is. Let's start with one of the most common acids which you'll see in GCSE chemistry, hydrochloric acid. And I want you to focus on this section of its name which I've highlighted there. Hydrochloric acid always forms a chloride, like for example sodium chloride which we just talked about. Now notice that chloride also has that same highlighted section in it. If you start out with hydrochloric, you always form a chloride every single time, and the clue is in the name. If it's hydrochloric and it contains that chlor, it always forms the salt whose name also contains that chlor section. So look out for that. If you have hydrochloric, it's always going to be a chloride. The chlorides formed by hydrochloric acid don't quite fit the naming scheme of all the other salts which you need to know. You'll see what I mean if we look at sulfuric acid. Now sulfuric acid, the name contains this section sulf, and sulfuric acid always forms a sulfate. So whatever the salt is which you produce from sulfuric acid reacting with something, the second part of its name is always going to be sulfate. Again, the name gives you a clue as to what it's going to be. But this one, instead of ending in ide, ends in ate. And actually, all the other salts which you see are all going to end in ate as well. It's only the hydrochloric acid forming chloride which breaks the rule. Everything else is going to end in ate. So sulfuric acid forms a sulfate. If you use nitric acid, you form a nitrate. Again, the clue is in the name. And if you're doing the OCR Gateway Legacy Specification, then this seems to be the only one which also expects you to know that phosphoric acid forms a phosphate. But by this point, you could have probably guessed that phosphoric acid was going to form a phosphate. Again, the name of the acid tells you the name of the type of salt. So running through those again quickly, hydrochloric acid always forms a chloride, sulfuric acid always forms a sulfate, Nitric acid always forms a nitrate, and phosphoric acid always forms a phosphate. Once you learn those, and once you learn that the name of the acid tells you what type of salt you're forming, it's pretty easy, right? That's not something which will take you very long to learn. But that's the hard part of this. That's the hard part of figuring out what salt you've got. The next step is even easier than this. In most cases, the other part of the salt's name is just going to be whatever metal also appears in the name of the reagents. It could be that you're just reacting a pure metal with the acid. So for example, you could be reacting magnesium with hydrochloric acid, in which case you'd get magnesium chloride. So there's that chloride from the hydrochloric acid and just the name magnesium from the magnesium which you've used. So again, magnesium plus hydrochloric acid would give you magnesium chloride. 
Alternatively, you could be reacting some sort of compound which contains that metal. So, for example, you could be starting out with copper oxide or copper carbonate. Both of them contain copper. And if you reacted those with, say, sulfuric acid, then you'd form copper sulfate. So the sulfate from the sulfuric acid and the copper from whatever that metal in the reactants was. Again, look for the name of a metal on the left-hand side of the equation or in your reactants, and that is going to tell you what the name of the metal in that salt is. All salts follow this naming pattern. Iron sulfate was made from something containing iron, or possibly pure iron, reacting with sulfuric acid. Uh, silver nitrate was made from something containing silver, reacting with nitric acid. Uh, copper chloride was made from copper, or something containing copper, reacting with hydrochloric acid. And it's just the same pattern over and over again. Look for the name of the metal, and it might be part of something else, but that's fine. And look for the name of the acid, and that should tell you what the salt is in most cases. There's one other thing which you might see instead of a metal, and that is the substance ammonia. Ammonia is pretty useful when it comes to producing things like fertilizers. And the way that we produce those fertilizers is we produce salts from ammonia. We react the ammonia with the acid. So the second part of that salt's name is always going to be the same pattern that we've already seen. Chloride, sulfate, nitrate, phosphate. But the first part of that salt's name is going to be ammonium. So not ammonia, ammonium. So if you start with ammonia, you will form ammonium phosphate or ammonium nitrate. And those are very useful because then we can put them into liquid solutions, into water solutions, and we can water them on our plants, and the plants can take those nutrients up through their roots, and the plants can use them then to grow. The acids which we're using are basically acid molecules dissolved in a water solution. So when we form our salt from the acid and whatever we react it with, that salt is going to be wet. It's either going to be dissolved in the solution itself, or it's going to be in a liquid solution and it's not going to be much use in there unless we can dry it off. We want to obtain dry samples because they're much more practical to handle and more practical to transport. And there's two key ways in which we can extract these. Firstly, if it's a salt which is dissolved in the solution, so for example, sodium chloride, table salt, or copper sulfate, both of those dissolve very easily in water. If we want to extract the salt from that solution, then all we need to do is allow the water to evaporate. And we can heat it up to make it evaporate even faster. Crystals will form as the water evaporates off. And so we will be left with solid, dry crystals instead of having that solution. If, on the other hand, we have a salt which is insoluble, and you'll know if it's insoluble because you'll see a precipitate formed. The solution will start to go opaque, so you won't be able to see through it. That's the standard sign that some sort of solid precipitate has been formed. And it will be tiny little particles, but nonetheless tiny little particles of solid in that liquid. If you form a solid precipitate, then separating that out from the solution is perhaps even easier. All you need to do is pour your solution with the solid precipitate in it through a filter. And all the liquid solution will go through and you will be left behind with the solid precipitate caught by the filter. You might need to dry that off a little bit as well, but you will be left with a powder. That salt will be the powder which is left behind. That's the precipitate. So to summarize quickly, if you've got a soluble salt that's in the solution and you'll be able to tell it's soluble because you'll be able to see straight through that solution, you'll be able to see, for example, newsprint behind it. If you've got that situation where it's soluble, you just heat the solution, the water evaporates off and you'll be left behind with solid crystals. If it's insoluble and so you'll see an opaque substance inside that solution, a precipitate, then you just pour it through filter paper and the solution will go straight through and the precipitate will be caught by the filter and you'll be able to dry that off and then you'll have that solid salt as the precipitate. That's all that most students will need to know about this. However, if you're doing the Edexcel specification, either the legacy specification or the new specification, then there's one extra thing which you need to know about, and that is which particular salts are soluble and which of them aren't. This, I'm afraid, is just going to be something that you're going to have to learn by rote. 
Uh, certain salts are soluble, certain salts aren't soluble. And what I've done is produced a Google document which you can link to either by clicking here or by checking the description of this video and you can print off a list of which salts are soluble and which salts are insoluble. Now they don't specify much about why they want you to know about this, although they do give one example and that is barium salts. Barium salts can be insoluble and when they are, that's really useful for one particular reason. What we can do is give a meal containing those barium salts to people who are having some sort of problem with their digestive tract. Because barium salts are insoluble, our bodies can't absorb them. They can't dissolve into our bloodstream through the lining of our intestines. And so they just stay in our intestines and pass through our bodies, which is pretty good because they're quite poisonous. They're also opaque to x-rays. That is, when you shine an x-ray at some barium salts, the x-rays do not go through them. They'll show up just as well as bones will on an x-ray. Normally your intestines, being soft tissue, wouldn't show up very well on an x-ray. So by giving someone a meal containing these barium salts, that allows you to get a much better idea of what's going on in their intestines when you x-ray them. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, revision tips, cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks, and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet, or computer, for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.